time we weren't anybody would get hired. Good evening, everyone. Before I call the meeting to order, I wanted to first take a moment to remember the life of one of our Liberty High students, Trevor Joseph Burroughs, who passed away on April 18th, 2023. Trevor's family shared that he was a busy child, hard worker, and loved the outdoors. He was a senior at Liberty High and enjoyed part participating in football and trap shooting. He also kept busy at his job with Shields. Trevor's smile and magnetic sense of humor brightened up any room he entered. Trevor loved spending time with his family and friends and was described as the life of the party. He was a genuine and loyal friend and was someone his friends could trust, confide in, and trust, and count on. The ICCSD Board of Education, as well as the entire community, send our condolences to Trevor's parents, Jill and Jeff, and his younger sister, Kyla, and his entire family and friends who will greatly miss him. At this time, I would ask that we take a moment of silence to celebrate and remember the life of Trevor Joseph Burroughs. Thank you. I now call this meeting to order. Thank you to those attending in person tonight and those staying engaged by watching our recording at a later time. The public is reminded that if they wish to speak during community comment, they will need to fill out a speaker form located in the lobby on a table and turn it in to Board Secretary Kim Coven, seated at the end on my left. Comments will take place during the designated community comment portion of our agenda. And before we move into tonight's agenda, I want to take a moment and introduce those seated at the table with me. To my right is Superintendent Matt Degner, Directors Pilcher Hyatt, East Ham, and Vice President Williams. To my left, Directors Abraham, Clausen, Finch, along with Board Secretary Kim Coven. At, that, at this time, we will move to our student reps. First up, um, we don't have reps tonight from Liberty High, but we'll move on to Jaden Shin. Is Jaden here? I don't see him, okay. We'll move on to Tate High. Gabrielle Williams? No? Okay, City High. All right, Ari. Thank you. Uh, Mary Kate would love to be here, but unfortunately, uh, she's at a dress rehearsal for our upcoming musical, Mamma Mia, which we're all really excited about. I know when that came out, like that was decided that kids were freaking out, really excited. Um, so that's coming up April 20th, 21st, and 22nd. So we're super excited to put that on. In other music news, we have our cathedral concert coming up actually tomorrow at six o'clock, which I strongly suggest you all come to. I know me and the rest of the choir kids are really excited. We have some very cool and interesting songs that we're, we're getting to sing, so we're excited about that. Um, we've really been enjoying the spring weather, our spring sports starting up. Tennis, which I just came from, we got to play for the first time on our new courts, which don't exactly have all the paint in order, but you know, getting to play there, at least for practice, has been really nice. Uh, and I know girls' tennis is really excited. We also have our soccer, boys and girls' soccer that have gotten off to a great start. Uh, coming from City High, our boys team was up 2-0 against Xavier, which is great. Uh, and then I know all our track kids are really excited to get back in the swing of things and running. Uh, we wanted to congratulate and kind of commend our City High mock trial team. We had four different teams go to state, which is really great, really great program. And I think it's actually a state, or not a state, a school record for us to send four teams. 
Um, we're also excited for our upcoming prom. Coming up May 6th, we decided on Midnight Rose Garden. Mm -hmm. So I know the whole student senate has been very excited, like kind of getting decorations and different stuff in order for that. Uh, yeah, so we've been really appreciating the weather, getting some sunshine, getting to wear some shorts and t-shirts. Uh, yeah, I think that's it, thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have the ICEA, ICEA update from the President, Brady Shutt. Uh, thank you, President Malone, Vice President Williams, Director, Superintendent uh, Degner. On behalf of the Iowa City Education Association, I do want to extend our condolences to the family and friends of Trevor Burroughs and to Jackson Schneckloff, as well as uh, the Liberty High staff and community. Uh, as a teacher at Liberty, I would also like to express my deep appreciation for the support provided by the district and its community partners, um, Laura Daly, uh, Kareen, uh, Frank and others, Lindy Schuckelbear, have been there. They've been tremendous in their support, compassion, and expertise that they've provided us these past few weeks. Uh, and I do want to extend on a related, somewhat related note that I'll get to, uh, thank you to the Iowa City Community School District Foundation. Uh, I was a part of the foundation's annual Big Ideas Hunt um, last month, late last month, and know firsthand how uh, the foundation's financial and marketing support really does support our staff's innovative uh, big ideas that can help our system grow to better support our students. And as I've gone through these last couple of weeks, one of the one programs that I thought about the most uh, in some ways is our NEST program. And the NEST folks came and presented to all of us as we know. And some of you of course may remember that uh, really NEST was in large part um, a product of the foundation's big idea hunt. That's what helped us get this off. Um, the ground. So as I watch student after student enter our nest and our space facilities at Liberty to be supported by amazing uh, staff members, um, no, I know that those successes are in large part because of what the foundation has done. It's a, re you know, it's a great return on our investment. And so I know one of the areas we'll continue to talk about as a district uh, is how we build that out, not just to our, our senior highs and to our secondary schools. I can absolutely see a a need in a world where we start building those layers of support at all of our elementary schools because I think the needs are, you know, are there. Obviously, we've had some profound events at, at Liberty, but I just think that that's an important conversation for us to have and to keep in mind. I just want to extend thanks to the foundation for helping us get that started. So, thank you. Thank you, President Shutt. Next up is community comment, but I just want to double check. I don't have any slips. Okay, we can move on. Um, move on to approval of tonight's agenda. I would entertain a motion. I move we approve tonight's agenda. Second. Uh, Board Secretary Coven, we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. I'll be a yay vote, Cam. Thank you, Director Clausen. Thank All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thank you. Before we dive into tonight's consent agenda, um, were there any questions regarding this first half of the bills? I reviewed them. I didn't have any questions. Okay. Were there any items that directors wanted to pull from tonight's consent agenda? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to approve tonight's consent agenda. I move approval of the consent agenda. Second. Board Secretary Coven, we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Next up is policy review. Um, I believe, Director Finch, this is just um, the third viewing of the 700 series. Is it the third? Okay, wow. Um, so there weren't any, um, yeah, thank you, President Malone. There weren't any um, um, major changes. Uh, there were no changes from the board. Uh, the biggest changes were to the nutrition program uh, involving the procedures, handling civil rights complaints, and meal charging policy and practice of dealing with negative account balances. No other major changes. Okay. Did any other directors have any comments or feedback? We will see those again in our action items. So thank you, Director Finch. Next up is our presentation. And is it Lou Interactive Playground? And is it Superintendent Degner? 
Just very briefly for me, we're going to turn it over to uh, Josh Reynolds and team here to talk to you about this uh, new opportunity in front of us that I know we're really excited about for our kids, and we'll just uh, let them take it away and introduce you to the product. This is Ben, uh, Ben Wells, he's uh, from Lou, he's an ambassador with Lou, which is a company we're going to introduce you to tonight, uh, and then we'll have back on the consent agenda next meeting for hopefully a vote. Um, ben is also a physical education teacher in Colorado, uh, and I'm Josh Reynolds, I'm a client services manager within the uh, Office of Technology and Innovation. Um, so about three years ago I got this position, uh, almost immediately I started receiving feedback from physical education teachers and building administrators, some kind of, sometimes uh, before and after school program coordinators about our gym technology. Uh, some gyms would have really state-of-the-art equipment, other gyms have basically nothing, um, just audio equipment, and then they will out a cart with a projector on it on the wall. Uh, unfortunately, gym equipment is pretty expensive. Uh, so over the last few years, we've been trying to standardize across the district, um, hard to try to find funding for this kind of project. Uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, not that long ago, I guess, uh, FMP 2.0 uh, was passed. There's a technology line item in that plan. And uh, almost immediately, I knew this is our chance to do this. Um, so we went out for bid. Uh, we received a couple of conventional bids uh, where you're getting projectors, some speakers, things like that. Uh, they all came in a little bit higher than I anticipated, uh, which was kind of disappointing. And then uh, kind of rethinking things, um, Alex, who is here today in the back, uh, came to me and asked me if I knew what the Lou was. At the time, I had no idea. Um, turns out it's a super innovative idea, uh, something that I'm super excited to present to you guys today. Um, and I'll turn it over to Ben, who will kind of introduce the product to you guys, and then we'll talk a little bit more after. Okay. All right, um, again, as he said, my name is Ben Wells. Uh, I teach in Falcon, Colorado, which is east of Colorado Springs. Um, it's a very rural community, a uh, lot high military. Um, I have been teaching there for about five years when we built the brand new school out there. Um, and this is something that I've had installed. I've been teaching for over 13 years, um, teaching K-12. I've taught in small rural districts. I've taught in big parochial schools. Uh, so. I've had the experience. Um, I also carry a master's degree in integrating technology within the classroom, and I have a technology background that rivals most district technology people just for fun. Um, you know, it's, it's what it is. So the Lou, um, when they asked me originally, they're like, well, we want you to go out and, and go see that. And it's like, great, I have family in Des Moines, I have fam my wife's from Quad Cities, so it's like, cool, I know the area, I, I, I get it, I know where I'm going. And they're like, they want to do this as a district thing, it's like, oh, that's even better. So what the Lou is, is it basically turns the gym space into a big interactive board, a big interactive wall. And so really what I wanna do, if I could get the, you know, anybody who's willing on the, on the board, if you'd like to stand up and go up to one of the screens, okay, and we're gonna just do a quick example of what it looks like. And so what I would like you to do is stand underneath one of the colors, and I want you to see how fast you can touch it as it goes. So anybody's willing. Director Pilcher Hyatt, give it a anybody's shot. Anybody's willing. <laughs> Go up and just try to keep touching it as it goes. Wait, wait, you can reach them. Any color. Any color. You can do any it, color. girl. You see that? Yep. Okay. Do it. Oh, I'm so stressed out. <laughs> doing great. <laughs> You're doing great. No, no, no. It's like the monkey game or whatever that thing is. The okay, cool. A mo. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Two things are going on there. One, yes, it was recording your score, but that was me touching my touchscreen computer. Um, in an actual space where the Lou is installed, it's actually a video tracking camera that's up by the projector that's tracking the movement on the screen. So my wall, the one I have installed, is 25 feet long by 19 feet tall. And this is just one of the many applications that can be used. Using a Target app, I can do everything from having kids work on striking with a paddle, to kicking a ball, to throwing a ball, to working in teamwork, passing a two-on-one defense, offense, trying to hit a target 
to the one that I'm kind of known for is I have the targets all above the top and I teach kids in my parkour unit to run all the way up the wall and hit the targets. Now it's reactive to their hands, it's reactive to a ball. Um, my, my adaptive kids that come in, it's reactive. I put a big, they have a big foam finger that they wear because they can't get out of their wheelchair to reach the wall. Um, or they'll use a noodle if they want to move faster. And so I have that ability. Um, again, this is one, one app that I just you know, kindly briefly went through with about a dozen different ways it can be used. Um, the other part of it is that when you look at some of these other apps, you have a mind word, which is actually, it's kind of like Hangman, but what it's done is in our community, the Lou community, which is all, everybody who has a Lou has access to the Lou community for free. I've actually had my first grade teachers um, who use the KCLA um, content, they have actually gone in and put in the first grade KCLA um, word lists, so then when I'm teaching and I'm working with my students, whatever skill they're working on, they're actually working on the word lists that are appropriate within their content, within their grade level. Um, I've had science that, done, uh, that has done it. I've worked with middle school. I have middle school uh, social studies when they're doing dates and times of things throughout history. We put pictures up, and depending on the level that they are at, they get different types, which then enters the kinetic learning arena because you have kids who are learning what's going on but they're moving because some of us just have a hard time sitting still and so it allows that to go on. Um, from that you have then into the math contents, you have art contents, you have the whole nine. Now this is something I teach six classes a day at 55 minutes. Um, I use it six to seven to eight different times every time. Every class K through five um, it is on from 8 in the morning till 3.30 in the afternoon. My kids have had it since I opened the building four and a half years ago. Um, to them, it's, no, it's nothing exciting. It's nothing ooh-ah. It's normal. Like, they're, to be honest, they're a little bummed that I'm, I'm here because my subs don't use it, um, just because I don't know what my subs coming in, what they have. But the kids, they're like, we know how to use it. Just leave it on, Mr. Wells. Just leave it on. I'm like, guys, I can't leave it on for three days straight because, you know, it's sitting there. Um, but it's something that even my teachers in the building, I have some open blocks, they come in, they can use it, um, they can move their content, we can collaborate on time. Um, I have sports, um, a middle school next door, so we'll have their sports team, especially in the winter, come up and I'll you know, run them through and have them going back and forth. And we've actually taken wrestling and in some of the contents where they're learning about the, their, their sixth grade wrestlers who don't really know the rules or understand, we put those in, and as they're doing the applications and doing things, not only doing moving, but they're learning those different parts of it. Um, so it opens up a wide variety. We also have our music um, productions. When we do shows in the gym, they actually now have the, the system has lights and sounds and a whole speaker system, so it actually becomes an ambiance. And so we actually have digital backgrounds. So now when they do performances in the gym, the whole wall and all the space becomes very immersive. Now, on that side of it, we also have the way to control the lights and sounds, uh, volume and brightness and all the sensitivity for our kids that may not do well in a high, a high in sensory environment. Um, it allows us to modify and change that down as well. Uh, we can also do in some gym spaces, you don't have the space to go outside and have multiple soccer goals set up. I can now put up different soccer goals, different basketball hoops and everything, but I can change the height on the fly. As somebody who's, you know, is teaching my fifth graders about basketball and stuff like that, well, my 10-foot basketball hoop and I get my wrench and I can lower it, I can put three of them up on the screen and I can press a button and it drops them down so they can work on those on their way up. So it gives me the opportunity to enhance the learning experience and give a station with everything else I'm doing. Um, it also creates the opportunity in some of the app applications, and I would love to take credit for this. This is one that I, I do share. I would love to take credit for it. Um, this one, they did a world championship, so they, can, they have all the schools across the world, which you're looking at about 1,500 loos now installed across the world. They challenge the other schools. So they put this up and say, okay, can you, you know, re solve it in the least amount of time, the least amount of hits? Again, I'd love to take credit for this. I can't. I did not teach them this. I had a third grader who sat back a little bit. He wasn't the most engaged type of kid, but he's a processor. And he's sitting there and he's looking at it and goes, well, can I borrow one of your tablets? And so he takes one of my tablets and he took a picture of the screen and he opened markup and he maddened it. He drew out all the possible combinations on the tablet, found the kid that was throwing at the wall and throwing at the wall, throwing at the wall, has no idea what he's doing. Great shot, great, excellent, great skill, great form, was struggling with what was going on. So he then showed the kid, says, I need you to hit here, here, and here. And if you do that, we're going to solve this. 
They did it. It's a record I cannot erase. I can't beat it. I can't solve it faster. I, and so it's been there for four years now. They started using each other to help improve each other. That's your difference between a coach and an athlete. One of them may understand the process, but it isn't gonna be the best performer. The other one has the performance skills, but it doesn't understand the process. Instead of them fighting or disconnecting, they came together. And so that's one of those things that I would love to say and take credit that I taught them. I didn't, they did it on their own. Um, it has now become part of what they do when we open up new apps. Uh, and so it goes through, I can show 40, 50, 60 different apps that they have and everything, but it really just shows the, the ambiance of what the, the environment is and how it enhances the education experience, um, K through five, through middle school, through high school. Um, so there's my quick little demonstration on it. Um, if you guys have any questions um, or thought processes or um, concerns, wonders, worries, thoughts, I would love to hear them and see if we can provide you with an answer. So <clears throat> it's a projector mm -hmm. and I'm mean, give me 19 by 25 on this wall. What's that look like? The from the edges. And and is that the max? So yeah, that's pushing it. And the reason mine is that big is because I did the specs myself, and I looked at what the projector can handle. In most of the schools that they're looking at, um, it's going to be slightly smaller than that, just because of the space they have and availability, um, and also the places where the natural daylight doesn't cause an interference. Um, but yeah, mine is roughly that panel the size of that panel. So it's essentially a projector with a, a camera that can read the movement. Yes, yeah, so it's a projector that's set back and then closer to it is actually, it's a Connect One, an Xbox Connect One uh, video camera mm -hmm. that has the, the, the 3D scoptic video um, and it's watching the wall. And so if I go stand there with my body, it doesn't, it doesn't register anything. It's looking for something about the size of my hand um, depending on what the application has. Now, some of the applications don't have them touching at the wall. As a teacher and anybody in here who's ever taught anything, this group is gonna do this for five minutes. 15 minutes later, oh, I was supposed to rotate. And it has an app up there that I can schedule that. And now the kid that goes, well, how much time do we have left? It, it's counting down for you. So I have you ready. I don't have to worry. I can work with each kid, each group individually, and it keeps me on track and on time. Um, so that's another part of it and yeah, so it's there and it's a big space and it's part of um, The station rotations I do the kids go through it depending on what we're doing um, And everything and is the lighting is that just for effect on the video or is no, that the lighting is system? part of it okay. So it has it has six uh, standard DMX lights and then it has two swirl pattern lights depending on the app um, and also you can, in fact, there's an app on there that you can put on just the lights. So if you're hosting a, a dance party or you're doing a glow party, you can turn them all black light and then everybody glows. Um, there's a teacher in Tennessee who does a big uh, glow bowling. And so when he turns them all on and puts the scoreboard up, it's like all the lanes light up and it's, it's a whole black light event. All right, thanks. So how much training does, training does it take to get all the so, teachers able to Yeah, that's to a good question. This? Um, as somebody who can do all of this without it, if you, can, if you can use a keyboard, that's as much training as it needs to run it because it is left, right, up, down, and okay to, to pick the apps. Um, in fact, there's a setting, and so if we look right here real quick, this, the ball, this free play mode, you don't even need the controller. So now I can put this on and the kids go up to the wall and they pick what they want to do and they pick and they start it just by picking everything. And once they go through it, then it goes back to the main menu again. So it doesn't even need the remote, um, but it is, you're going up, down, left and right, and you press okay, and escape takes you out of it. And so it's, it's very intuitive. As somebody who wanted to make sure anybody could use it, that was something I looked for in lieu um, when I was going through it. Uh, my question was also, uh, how much training does it take for the, to, for the teachers? To be able to utilize this? And so that is based on the teacher's experience and desire um, to, to use it within. Um, they are, as when they have it installed, they are offering, um, and Bloom does offer several trainings um, to allow teachers um, the opportunity to take those steps. Um, I have done trainings and I've done videos for teachers and everything, and that's something that we build that relationship that way to make sure that there's, you know, every teacher gets the support they need. Um, some teachers use it for a few things, and some teachers jump in and, and try to use it as many ways as possible. But it's to what the teacher, what the teacher can do. 
So initially, in the quote that you have in front of you, uh, obviously it's not finalized yet, otherwise we'd be having a different conversation, but um, we're looking at purchasing uh, 12 PD hours um, in two different, uh, different six-hour days. Um, we're hoping to get one installed before summer and have kind of a grand opening uh, showing it off to all the gym teachers and then another uh, session before school starts with all the physical education teachers and the uh, principals. And I guess my last question is, uh, Matt, does this fit within the PE curricular, curriculum that we have? We're not, here? that's a great question uh, and something that I just want to be very clear with. We're not looking to replace any curriculum. This is just going to be an additional option. Um, so we were already looking at upgrading technology. Uh, this is just a solution that costs within the same range as a, any other projector that we were looking at. Um, so we're hoping this gives more options to our gym teachers, uh, our physical education teachers, sorry, uh, and our before and after school programs, things like that that can utilize it. And if I could jump in really quickly, we did engage with Jan Granko, yeah. PE program coordinator, extensively. Uh, when we were first looking at and then evaluating this process, she went with us to visit a school in Mitchellville that has this in place within their elementary structure. Um, and we also worked with Carmen on this. So we've, we've tried to really make sure that we're not just putting something in where there isn't buy-in necessarily from the key curricular area that's going to be leveraging this technology. So as Josh said, this is not curriculum. This is not going to replace anything we have in place but we do believe based upon their input that this is going to really facilitate the things they're already trying to do within their curriculum. Okay, good, thank you. And it does, um, from the Lou community and stuff like that, the, kid, the content is created by teachers. And so, like I showed, the, the first grade example actually falls within the, our Colorado state standards of that. Um, and the several schools that are within each state, they, they mark them and everything saying it is the standard. Um, so when we talk about alignment and cross-curricular, um, collaboration uh, it is there and as within the PE as the PE national standards and such like that um, this will enhance what we're doing by providing um, those options to another option to meet those standards um, you talked about it being um, adaptable for different kids of different physical abilities mm -hmm. Do, is there like a description with each one of those apps that talks about how to adapt it or what type of physical level is needed so there is a little bit, and the reason I say a little bit is for the same reason of when you look at any type of PE equipment or any type of equipment in general, the adaptability comes from the person who's using it. Um, so we've done in the Lou community and as well in their descriptions and stuff, they've done um, a, a good job of explaining how it can be, but when it comes to changing up those things because there are so many variables, um, they've started to create in, the, in their curriculum, they've listed out different ways, uh, however, it becomes a 17,000 page document by the end of it. Um, but we have such a you know, phenomenal base that works on it that if you ask, say, hey, I'm having somebody who, you know, I have a student who's partially blind, how can, you know, how can I do this? And then they, you have so many people coming and saying, okay, this is how I've adapted it, this is how I've adapted it, um, and everything that way. So it really sits down to you know, what, what can you come up with? Um, again, an example is with the targets. I do have a student who is partially blind, so instead of using targets that are only this big, I can make them, I can make them three, four times bigger um, on the fly and let her be able to see it that way. Um, and so it, it provides that opportunity as well. Yeah, I always think about, you know, to Charlie's question and then connected it to yours, Ruthina, you know, we have curriculum that our staff needs and then they have strategies, right? And this is an obvious strategy that we'd want our staff you know, to feel comfortable with and using, and it really opens up a lot of possibilities to be able to reach the whole continuum of learners we have, right? It's one more strategy to be able to do that. And so it would, I think it, it gives us nothing but more ways to reach um, that whole continuum of students we serve. I think that that's my question, because it's hard for me to ask good questions about this since I've never seen anything like it. Um, what, you know, if, if one of the goals we had when, when we were looking for something like this was to find PE activities or um, platforms that could be used by more kids with different abilities, that, say, that sounds good. Um, what other, like, what 
what brought our district to wanting this? What were we, what were we hoping to get out of it? And then the other question would be like, um, what concerns did you have that you don't have anymore after learning more about it? Yeah, so to be honest, I wasn't looking for anything that touched curriculum. I have never taught. Um, so I was just looking for a technology solution that was easy to implement. Everyone, our teachers could travel from one gym to the next gym and it'd be the same. They wouldn't have to relearn a new system every time. Um, I was just looking to get something that standardized it for the sake of the end user and for the sake of our team who has to support those. Um, when we went to Mitchellville, uh, one of the first things that we realized right away was the engagement level of those kids. Uh, I accused Bloom and Lou of paying these kids under the table uh, <laughs> because they were so engaged and they brought in kids that were working on uh, persuasive speaking and things like that from their language arts class and they came down and talked to us. And it was really exciting to see that. Um, I had some concerns about brightness. Uh, we've talked a little bit through some of that stuff. Um, so the accessibility part uh, was a big one. Um, I, and honestly, I'm not too concerned about anything. I, I think everything that we were looking for, this offers. Um, one thing we haven't highlighted, I guess, is uh, principals, their ability to hold assemblies currently um, in some of the gyms is lacking. And this has a very loud uh, speaker system and wireless microphone uh, that plugs into the remote. Um, so I think overall it's gonna be pretty good for everyone involved. And to make it really clear, just because I'm not sure it's been explicitly said, um, as Josh said, we were originally just looking for an AV solution, and this projection system is actually the same projector that we had identified as sort of our ideal for gymnasiums to begin with, and it can still do screen mirroring, and it can handle presentations and those sorts of things. So we've really highlighted the interactivity here. Um, but when it's not being used for those functions, it provides a very large uh, display, as Josh mentioned, with high quality audio that can be leveraged for a number of different situations that we face within our gymnasiums. And one thing about Lou with all of that is in, in some products, you're locked into their platform. You're locked into their environment. And what Lou has really done is because they know teachers and educators use a variety of things, it is a full, it is a full computer. I can show a Google slide deck that has my SOPs, it has my, uh, my learning plan, um, I can bring in videos, I can do Google Meets with um, you know, presenters I have around the country. So it is not just only this, I can very quickly switch it and I have a full computer, which as a teacher, it eliminates me having to run two or three different things, it, it puts it all in one. Do you have information on how many um, districts have this technology and, and like satisfaction surveys, something like that, that we could look at? So I know that they do have it. Um, within the state of Iowa, I want to say there are, and there's, Alex. There's about four districts, I believe, that yeah. have it in the state of Iowa for a total of eight, uh, seven or eight loos installed. Um, installed. So the closest one to us is Mitchellville uh, or Marshalltown. Mitchellville, if you're not familiar with it, is part of Southeast Polk's district. Um, so that's the one we went and saw in person. Um, and, and how long has it been at that district? The third just finished the second school year. Okay. I guess I was curious about, like, it, does, is the interest by the students, is it sustained? So um, I've had mine for four and a half years, and one of the things that I really gauge it upon is I do what's called a parent PE week a couple of times a year because nobody comes and talks to the PE teacher during conferences. Um, <laughs> so... I, Thank you. Um, it's so I make sure I engage with the parents. Um, they come in, they're, they're a student in class. And my current fourth graders were kindergartners the first year and when we had it open. And the first thing those parents, not only do their kids always talk about, but the parents come in going, what's new on the loop? That's the, they, they only get to come twice a year, but that's one of the things they're engaged. I've had parents come from other schools where a choice in district that they've choiced into our school because of this being something that they have. Um, my master's research was done on this over a period of two years and the participation and engagement in students just climbed um, because of that and it's sustained because not only are there all sorts of variations that I can do with the different apps, but they bring two to three to four apps out every year that you get and you get to try and get to do and get to use. So when I started, there are 40, 47 apps on this now. When I started, we had 20 and um, it's just, it, there's there's no limit. I have yet to ever, even the high schoolers and the middle schoolers that I've had come in, I have yet to ever have anybody go, ah, 
because it's not that. It's something very different. It's something very um, engaging, and it just it changes the perspective because you're not only getting the kids who are extrinsically motivated by their own ability, now they're extrinsically motivated by a score or by a problem, and so it's it's a never ending um, never ending so source of dopamine for them. Um, they they really really enjoy it. And feedback that I've received from districts is teachers want to come teach at the school um, that actually has the loop. <coughs> if it's more interactive, they can have more fun in the PE. And students also want to go to Mitchellville Elementary School because they get to have the loop. It's fun for each PE class to go down there. So it kind of helps you attract talent as a district on the PE teacher side, but also keeping students and the community involvement with the excitement of this technology within your district. Were there any other additional questions or comments from directors? You know, I, I would just say, you know, I mentioned the AV, because that's one thing you go to these gyms and it's all over the place and usually just terrible. Like the sound doesn't match, it doesn't, and you roll the cart out. And so it's just, you know, the, I mean, I just think that's the PE piece, I get it, it's engaging. You know, this is like, right, what are, I teach and all day kids are on their phone playing mindless games, and this just takes that and adds the gamification piece to PE in a way that's gonna to speak to kids, I see that. But, but I don't wanna undervalue this idea of having a consistent AV system that is just useful in so many ways where we have these assemblies and you've got 300 kids there and you can't hear anything that's happening because your AV system sucks. And so to have something that quality, um, and I'm looking at the pricing obviously that, you know, you, you get what you pay for. I think in my opinion. So, you know, that's just obviously what we have to think about. And if staff is getting feedback from, from our PE folks here, you know, I'm pretty excited about it. Yep. I agree, JP. That's one of the first things that jumped out to me when Ben and Josh brought this to me. Well, first, I had to figure out why I wasn't sending Ben Graham to something called Playgrounds. And then once they explained that part to me, I was like, oh, all right. And I thought of back to our COVID experience. We did our COVID clinics in our elementary school, and Chris and I were there, and these families would bring all their kids. And just the discrepancies and the different AV systems that were set up in the gyms, and we couldn't keep kids entertained. And so when they brought this to me, I was like, okay, this is something that we need to utilize for that exact reason that you're talking about. And so I appreciate you sharing that. It's one of the first things that jumped out to us when, when they brought this to us. And, and I'll say I appreciate it because, you know, I was here when we first got smart boards. I didn't like them at the time. I'm like, this is going to be obsolete in no time. They're janky. They're not very good to begin with. But when I think about the technology this is using, it's nothing that's going to be, ob you know, lights and speakers obviously are not going to be obsolete. And then, yeah, a connect reader. I mean, that, that's not gonna, it's not like buying this whole system where part of it's gonna not be functional in four years and you gotta replace the whole thing. Like, I, I thought about smart boards, and I was right. Um, so, so that, because, I, you know, in my opinion, when you're a public school and you buy something, that should last for like, I mean, I'd love it to be 100 years, like our floors, but honestly, you want to get bang out of your buck and you want long-term investment in, in stuff. So that, and, and you guys are new. Um, and I, you know, I can't predict the next 10 to 20 years, but you know, when I think about spending this amount of money, I want that to last for a very long time, long after I'm on the board. And that, so that's a piece of it. And I think you mentioned across the world, 1,500 of these. And then my question would be, how active is that community? As far as you said, well, if you have a question about a student, you know, can you just go out? And is there a, a website somewhere? And they're like, people are just throwing their ideas out. So there are. In the US, there are nine ambassadors like myself. Okay. Um, in Canada, there are three, and we've got two over in Europe. And they're basically, the allowed to pick the ambassadors based on the, the excitement, the engagement, or whatever. And I'm, consider I'm considered like the super user because I do make instructional videos for them. My kids get to demo stuff first. Um, and again, I use it all the time. I'm, I'm really passionate about it. Again, I can do this without any of this software. I can do this. but it makes it so it's so much more engaging for my entire building. Um, so those ambassadors, we, there's the Facebook group that they're a part of that, I mean, those questions and concerns and everything pops up to new ideas. Um, it is like every day, I'm, my phone has been going off like three times since I've been standing here of different things. Um, and they're, the other side of that, and, and really when you look at stuff like that is also the support side of it. 
and Lou, yes, they are a younger company and they are growing and they are doing a really good job of it. However, as somebody who values support more than anything else, their turnaround time on support is about 15 minutes in almost any time zone, um, at least across the continental US, um, be it that they are in Quebec and so they are on the East Coast uh, time. But I have yet, uh, to all the ambassadors, to all the schools, to everybody I work with, there has been a time where it's been, you know, within that time range where they're either checking in or they're providing a response, they're providing cues, they're, and so it is something where they actively engage with their community of users as well. Um, and when you look at the World Championships, the last World Championships had um, upwards of 400 schools across the world engaged in the World Championships. And they open that up to everybody. So you've got a, you've got a really active base of people. Thank you. That's all. Thank you so yes. much. And thank you thank for you. volunteering. Yeah, well, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for being a great sport. Next up, we have the 21st Century Grant Discussion. Superintendent Degna. Yeah, this was an item we brought back to you after some community comments from our last meeting, and then it's also a revisit from a presentation you received in August, uh, but that was a lengthy meeting uh, when we delivered that presentation in August, and it's been some time since then. And so uh, Laura is going to uh, take the next two items here for us that are discussion items and provide a small overview uh, for each of those, and then make sure that you have an opportunity to have any questions answered. Um, I will say from the 21st century grant perspective that remember the, uh, the genesis of this is that these 21st century grants are rolling off and our BASPs no longer have access to those. So the number of students that were able to scholarship is smaller. Uh, and so we're, we are still scholarshipping some students that Laura explained how that funding breakdown works. Um, but obviously last time they came uh, a, a lot of uh, concerned folks and asked for the district to commit more resources there. Uh, unfortunately, we don't feel like we have more resources to give in that area, but uh, we do have some opportunities to try to continue to partner and work together right now, and then also some areas to explore long-term moving forward. So with that, I'll let Laura kind of take it away here. Thank you, Superintendent Degner, and hello, everybody. Also, um, I would like to just give credit to Amy Clare. She's not with us tonight, but she is an extended day learning um, coordinator in our department. So she oversees um, a lot of this, has been the one to write the grants over the years. So um, she really has kind of been uh, the person that has a lot of the answers and helped us you know, provide some information for tonight. We also have Crane Frank. She's a coordinator in our learning supports department as well. And she works closely with Amy and I um, as we oversee this in our department. And of course, as um, Superintendent Degner um, just mentioned, there's been many others here as well. And if you ask me questions that I may not be able to answer about the funding, um, I might ask less to, to help out with some of that as well. Um, so what we're gonna go over tonight um, is a summary of what you may remember back in August that we reviewed, and that was a little bit of an abbreviated um, presentation. And um, so hopefully we'll fill, fill in a few gaps tonight with a little bit of additional information. So we'll just give an overview of um, what extended day programming is, some historical context, kind of what has a 21st century learning center program looked like um, so that we understand what may not be able to be provided moving forward with the impact on the funding. And then um, just some different options that we're exploring. Um, we use the extended day program term just to encapsulate any before, after school, and summer programming. Um, we all know that BASP stands for before and after school programs. We have programs in all of our elementary schools, with the exception of the online program, of course. And for the uh, sites that do not have 21st century grants in them, they, of course, are funded through private pay, so that's parents and guardians just paying the fees, um, child care assistance. Um, and we know that in uh, earlier this year in February, DHS um, announced um, some expansion on the eligibility and access um, requirements for child care assistance, so that was good news. And then also in those non-21st sites, 
um, through save dollars from the district, we allocate what we call bridge care scholarships. And that's just a district term for bridge care. It's not like an official term. We just refer to them as bridge care because it's just intended to maybe for some families bridge the gap until they qualify for CCA or they just may need it temporarily or some families may need that scholarship you know, longer term. So then in the sites that have had um, 21st century learning centers, um, currently there's three schools. We've got a chart next that shows all the schools that have had them over the years. They're still, because it's a blended program, so there's still private pay that comes in. There's still child care assistance. Of course, the grant funds um, pay for certain services within that, well, which I will outline here in another slide. Um, and then also district um, save funds are used as a match. And the match means that as schools are awarded the grant funds, the district has a responsibility over five years to um, match a certain portion of the funds because the grant award decreases each year. So I'll get into that a little bit more, but those are just some key terms as we're heading into this. And then, um, as we have mentioned before, our CDAC, which stands for the Community Education Advisory Committee, um, they're an advisory council that oversees approximately 5% of the district save dollars and establish priorities for how that money is used and allocated. And so that council continues to prioritize um, the extended day programming among some other things within our district. And then, of course, that's what save dollars stand for. I think the last time I presented, I said I just threw that in there to make less happy about the save definition there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so where our extended day programs, we have four different entities. So four organizations that run our various sites at our elementary schools and um, an independent parent-run board simply means that the parents form a board, they oversee the BASP. Um, it, all of these agencies have um, interagency agreements with the district. Um, Neighborhood Centers of Johnson County is another agency, and then Champions is our one entity that is, an, is a for-profit, all the others are non-profits, and then also we've had a um, long-standing relationship as well with Coralville Parks and Rec. <coughs> so the schools that are on the screen that are in blue, Kirkwood, Alexander, and Twain, those are the ones that currently have 21st century programs. Those are the ones with the grant funds. The ones that have parentheses with the year are the ones that have had grant funds, the so 21st grant funds in the past, in the year that they expired. All right, so then um, as we go along, just some of the um, aspects of a 21st century program um, over the years in our school district, it's been 22 years, as we're in eight different schools, um, 7,000 to 9,000 students have been served over that time span. What those 21st century grant funds provide are 30 scholarships, so that's, you can, the students get to go to the program and it's paid for through that scholarship. Um, it pays for teachers, the after school teachers to provide tutoring. It pays for enrichment activities such as um, the extension service uh, 4-H, I'm trying to think the science, the uh, children's museum, various uh, community partners that come in and provide enrichment activities. Um, it pays for transportation, pays for a site coordinator to oversee the programming and services, um, ongoing professional development to the extent that it comes at a cost. There's a program evaluation that's conducted um, in partnership with the University of Iowa, and then some family engagement uh, events and activities. So the 21st century programs, that's kind of the package of what those schools um, receive when they get the grant. Over the course of the years, our trend data has been positive that students have achieved um, and improved their academic growth. 
Um, it's serving students and families of color, um, and our families consistently report a welcoming feeling. There's many more statistics in a much longer um, report that the university, as I mentioned, um, completes with us, but this is just a really compacted summary for the purpose of this presentation tonight. And then um, some key elements to keep in mind are that um, with recent changes to um, private pay as well as term limits, that is impacting our ability to be able to even apply for the grants in the future. So what the private pay means is that in, um, I think it was 20, April 2021, um, was when any of our private pay fees, Les, Les is looking at me, is that correct? <laughs> I think it was April 2021, when um, any of the private pay fees had to be documented and reported. And while that is not income to the district because any private pay fees would go to the partner agency, um, that still has to be subtracted from the grant award amount. And we hadn't had to do that before. So that was, that, that was a change that impacted the total grant amount that we had access to. And then um, we then were up uh, found out that there was a new implementation of a 10-year term limit. So each of these grants is a five-year grant. So if the intent is that through the match funds that are expected, again, that our district uses save dollars to pay for, that you become a sustaining program and you no longer need grant funds. And um, so this 10-year ten ten, ten term limit was implemented and that's impacting our ability to even be able to apply for 21st century grants um, any longer. So that has put us in a situation then where, um, that's the situation that we're in currently. Um, so because we've received multiple grant awards um, at those high FRL buildings, because 21st century grants, that's probably an important thing I should have said, is only for high FRL buildings to apply to we're just no longer to, able to um, receive those funds or even apply for them. So the plan now for sustainability of our BASPs um, has to do with, uh, we did have the ability to use some ESSER funds, um, but those two are um, going to be diminishing at the end of this summer. So for that time period that we had the um, option to use ESSER funds, um, Les, you know, his masterful plan for how we, he knows how to do all of this. He might be able to explain it or add to it. Um, we didn't tap into the save dollars for a temporary time frame. We used the ESSER funds to pay for the programming so that once the ESSER funds go away, we can tap into a little bit of those safe funds to be able to try to sustain the programming. Um, the way Les kind of has explained it to us is, you know, there's never an assurance that you're going to get the grants that you apply for. And so I'm um, having a little bit of carryover each of those years with the save funds now is a good thing because as those funds run out this summer, we're gonna be able to try to use the safe funds that we have available to us um, to and try to think of the way that they're going to have the you know highest impact um, to be able to sustain some of the programming. Um, as we know, then the um, the district has earmarked approximately two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars to continue to be allocated from Save. Keep in mind with those two. Um, sites that will continue to have programs after this year, which is Kirkwood and Alexander, um, we will need to use some of those saved dollars for the match for the grant. So by doing that, that impacts how much money from SAVE is available to distribute bridge care scholarships. At the two schools that continue to have our 21st century programs until they expire, they'll still be able to access the grant funds and still have scholarships, but those scholarships will be decreased just a little bit, again, because we don't have as much backfill back from SAVE 
to be able to um, provide the number of scholarships that we typically do. So back on this slide, we indicated that there were 30 scholarships that are provided. We're projecting about 20 scholarships per site <coughs> at um, both Kirkwood and Alexander for the next couple of years. That could fluctuate depending upon um, a variety of factors. So we know that our goal is to continue to sustain um, participation and access to our BASPs um, as other schools have come off of these grants over the years, um, they have moved to our standard BASP model. So this year, Twain, you know, is coming off of the grant. Um, we knew last year Hills did. Um, so those both have just done as the other schools in that chart at the beginning of the presentation have done, and they just moved to that standard operation of a BASP model. We will continue to use those available SAVE funds to distribute Bridge Care scholarships. Um, we will prorate those based upon our top um, FRL schools. They'll have a few more um, spots reserved than our lower FRL schools. And we also are exploring um, other grant opportunities. To the best of our knowledge, 21st Century is um, the only grant that we're aware of that is specifically honing in on uh, before and after school. Um, but we are currently working with neighborhood centers of Johnson County um, and in the process of drafting a grant, uh, the full service community schools grant that is a more comprehensive model than just after school uh, programming. And we can keep you updated on that. It, um, we're nowhere near the completion of the grant, but that is in progress. And um, some of the takeaways are, it's obvious that there are many benefits of extended day programming. We want to continue the access and sustainability of these programs. Um, we want to continue to support our structurally disadvantaged students and families by prioritizing those bridge care scholarships to our higher FRL schools and families. Um, while also distributing them on a prorated scale to all schools. Um, as we are looking at this, we're going to need to monitor and adjust as needed and consider, consider other funding um, avenues that we may have available to us or that we seek out. Um, I guess I would add to that that um, this summer, um, kind of a, a a positive note, with the ESSER funds that I mentioned earlier, um, we are able to provide some summer scholarships that we typically don't provide over the course of the summer. Um, and those would be at the non-21st sites. So we're using every ounce of those ESSER dollars um, before they expire. And um, some of the money that had been allocated this year to Hills uh, through that carryover so that we could increase their number of scholarships. There's currently 15 scholarships that are being used for their BASP, and there are approximately 11 students using the bus transportation that we um, provided just for this year. So with that, I will open it up to any other questions and um, ideas for moving forward. Are there any questions from directors? Comments? Uh, um, looking at the program evaluation data, 81% of students show academic growth in these, these uh, before and after school programming. 77% of the students are students of color. Those are pretty good numbers. Um, <clears throat> so to me, they suggest that we should uh, look about how to increase the number of students who need uh, financial assistance to participate in this these programs, how we can provide that assistance. And I'm not quite sure why there's some <coughs> apparent limitation on the use of SAVE funds. So maybe you can provide or less or someone can provide a brief description of why that's the case. Uh, the district has made an allocation of the SAVE funds that are received um, primarily for our facilities use and technology as well as for these uh, resources to support our uh, 
before and after school program. So it's an allocation that we've done. We'd have to change that allocation going forward. And I would remind you as a board, you've got a number of those saved resources committed to repay bonds that right. uh, funded FMP 1.0 and now FMP 2.0, and so that does reduce the amount that's available for uh, technology or for before and after school programs, both which otherwise would have to come from uh, general fund dollars. So is the number that we have to have saved dollars available for these scholarships, is that number really clear, Les? Uh, it's, we've kept it pretty stagnant, or not stagnant, but steady um, throughout the life of these programs. Uh, because the programs have been uh, steady until they started dropping off in 2019 and 20, as uh, Laura's slide showed. Uh, but we then uh, adjusted our allocation of the number of scholarships and that uh, bridge care that we could provide at various buildings looking at the uh, FRL priorities within the district. <clears throat> so. If we have a school, um, and we probably can't be that specific, right, um, because we don't, we don't want to disclose who has FRL and who doesn't, but um, we did have people come talk to us at our last meeting, and how does this, what we just talked about right now, how does it respond to what they talked about at the meeting? If you could just connect the dots so that I can have more clarity on it. Many of those parents um, were from Twain Elementary, and so their 21st century program is concluding in June of this year. And so what I heard from them, and you know, we all um, may have had different takeaways, but their main concern was care, mm -hmm. that they need care for after school so that they can continue to um, you know, maintain their jobs, their employment. And um, they also then noted, so, so many of the benefits. I mean, even to the extent of saying my child is learning, you know, more language and practicing that if there happened to be an English learner. Um, but the main theme seemed to be that we just really need that care. We need a quality program for our kids to have some level of enrichment in. Um, so some of them mentioned that they um, are the recipients of scholarships. And so they, the connection is that they probably want to continue and need to continue to have some level of scholarships. So that's, uh, yes, yeah, so do you want to, is there a segue? Oh, I'm just trying to still figure it out though. So I understood what they're asking for. Um, and our response is a lot of information that's hard for me to understand all at the same time. But uh, um, our response is we are losing some scholarships. Yes, right? because the grant funding I mean, is no longer right. there that paid for the scholarships. Right. We're okay. losing some scholarships, but the district will be working to make allocations for some of those scholarships yes. we're losing. But not as all. not all, right? We can't we can't do all, but we're also looking into additional funding with working with um, right now the neighborhood centers since that's the um, provider for that program. Correct. We'll explore long-term funding opportunities to try to restore, you know, a higher level of scholarship, you know, to uh, the amount of families. But yes, the reality is, I mean, we are not going to be scholarshipping as many families as we did previously in the before and after school program. So some of those families are going to be impacted financially. Uh, the program will still be there. They would still be able to participate, but now, you know, there's going to be some that would have to pay uh, for that option. I mean, what the district's able to allocate is through the save dollars that we walked through about what, you know, maybe just to throw out numbers, something like 10 to 20, depending on your campus, where it used to be supported a level of 30 students. So that's where it becomes difficult. And if you want to have a conversation around save dollars, then I think we would want to talk to you about, okay, what are the other trade-offs of, um, you know, displacing save dollars to support this? And those aren't easy pivots uh, for the district to make because of some of those commitments. So long term, you know, when we started this conversation in the fall, there was a grant cycle that was coming up. I think it was due in early September. Um, neighborhood centers in the district was not able to get an application together in time to submit for that one. Uh, we do plan to partner, you know, with them at, on a, another submission. But there are some impacts to even the function of our staff 
in their day-to-day -day responsibilities during the school day that we want to work through with them because it will impact our student and family advocates. Uh, so there's some bigger conversations that need to happen with neighborhood centers, but I think the most directed impact that you should be aware of is yes, some families will be impacted about their opportunity to attend that programming for free. You know, one of the things that I would really like to see us consider is when we um, make a decision on who can operate a BASP in our schools, requiring them to take child care assistance, um, because that is such an untapped funding resource. There is money out there from the county, from CCA, to provide scholarships for a certain class of families. It's not, it's not all of them, but it is, a, it is a class of families that can get scholarships and funding through CCA. And it's just unfortunate that not all of our BSA partners are, are willing to go through the certification process to get themselves um, eligible to take those grants. But I do think that we as a district have some leverage since we're allowing them to operate in our space to really encourage and then maybe we get to a point where it's a, it's a mandatory um, thing that if you're going to use our space and our facilities, you have to take child care assistance. You know, thank you, Vice President Williams, because I was uh, just looking up to see if that program still existed, um, because I know when I was part of a before, parent run before and after school program, we did go through the certification to accept um, CCA funding, because it is, I mean, it's money that a lot of our families qualify for, and it's guaranteed funds because it's coming from this pool of money. So my question is, um, are some of our other partners like Champions, Neighborhood Centers, are they accepting these funds? Do you know which ones are, Laura? We, um, we've got it on the slide here that just Coralville Parks and Rec offers partial scholarships but does not accept CCA. So does that mean everybody else accepts CCA? Mm -hmm. And so then are we um, able to perhaps some of the families that came to talk to us may qualify for CCA. Is there a way for us to further educate them about this program and perhaps assist them with applying? Because there's, I mean, based on, it's based on income, but some of our families may qualify and not even know that. Some of the feedback we got um, at the, the Latinos for Education group is it's so complicated and so if there were a way to have like um, the way they described it is it would be nice if it could say what are you looking for I am looking for BASP click okay um, and then the next question would be do you need it for this do you qualify for this no okay then do you qualify for this yes okay but I think to <laughs> To um, Ruthina's point, I think that's the confusing part. So I just want to make sure if that we're using everything we can, like there might be scholarships that aren't getting tapped into too, which is what we've heard at different times. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to lose some because we because of this loss of the grant, I just want to see if there's any other ways to plug those holes with existing scholarships that maybe families don't know they qualify for. We do. Aside, I'm not talking about CCA right now, but any of the bridge care scholarships, if they aren't used at any particular schools, um, we monitor that on a monthly, regular basis, and then make sure that if you know a school need, does need some of those scholarships later in the year, but we divert those to schools. So we've got a chart that lists schools and what their allocation is, and some of those schools have more scholarships being used because other schools didn't use some of the scholarships. And I'm sorry, I just wanted to offer one edit. When I say it, we offer training, I also mean, I mean, with our community partners that's providing the service. So I don't want um, folks thinking that there's further action I'm asking are no, already okay. stretched I mean, and that, I think that's the way, okay. you know, we would receive it that way. I mean, part of this is their responsibility to inform families of those funding avenues as well. They're the ones providing the care. We're partners, of course, in the building, uh, but this is after school or before school care. And so, of course, we'll work with them. We are great about disseminating that information. Our SFAs are great partners in that work. We know we have access to, to the families as well. So, yeah, I think we're okay, uh, President Malone. Back to the CCA, I, I'd be also curious to make sure that none of the providers are limiting the CCA spots because that's a common thing that we see in the community. You'll have 
a child care center, but they only have two CCA spots. And so they say, oh, we accept CCA, but it's only, they have only two spots. And so for our schools with high FRL concentrations, if they only have one or two CCA spots and they say, oh, we accept it, that's, that, that's not gonna work for, for that particular site. So I'd be curious if, if they are all offering it, is it an unlimited amount of spots or are they narrowing it? And so I'm going to speak out of turn here because I haven't talked to my team about this, but I, and Amy might know better, but I won't ask her to respond since we haven't discussed it, but I, there's some point in my history in the district here where we've engaged BSA, BASP providers around things that we would like to see them include. And I, I think that's, sometimes that's been difficult conversations, right? And so part of what I'm thinking here and hearing from you guys is there might be some considerations we want to talk about or have as a district that we say, this is what we'd like our BASP providers to be considering uh, when doing this and moving forward, some of these specifics that we're getting into there, and then engage them in that conversation that really to be a provider, we would like to see these things included. So I think that's something I'd like to talk to the team about and then probably bring back to you guys based on some of the feedback you're sharing here to say, hey, are these things that we're really looking for in the providers so that we can, knowing that we work with four different groups and really even the independently operated parent run boards, I mean, we count that as a group, but that's almost like having nine different groups that we're working with in that section. Um, so it's difficult, right? I mean, it's a little bit difficult to get some of those parameters and, and some of those things in place. Um, but I think that would be a good starting point for us because there's, there's some consistent things. And then when we have schools that look more alike than different, what are we doing for those, um, you know, five schools that have the most structurally disadvantaged kids and what are the requirements maybe of a provider there in comparison to a school that doesn't have uh, some of that, that same continuum of students? Yeah, man, I'm glad you brought that up because um, that's one thing I thought about with some of the, our parent-run boards is, you know, for the families in those schools who can pay, are we, are they maximizing that leverage, you know? And then two, not to throw fuel on the fire, but we're not even talking about special ed kids. Because if you had a conversation with those folks in BASBs, we have a whole nother conversation that they don't take certain kids. So, but that takes a whole nother, a whole nother level of funding and training that frankly doesn't exist. I mean, you know, the honest conversation is if we want to up our RAM class sizes to 36 and 38, we'll have money for this. But the truth is, those are the choices that we're going to have to decide on. But I, but I think the, the more we can refine things down to a system where if you encounter a BSP in the Iowa City Community School District, wherever you go to school, you can kind of expect these things. And CCA funding and, and the things that are in our control other than, you know, um, obviously we can't give up on debt service, right? There are things that we just can't. We can't move on, but I think where we have this flexibility to sort of bring folks in line to, you know, to have some of these similar expectations, I think that is something we can do. Um, because, I mean, at the end of the day, it just sucks that we lost this funding and these grant opportunities. And unless you replace that with something, we can't manufacture that, that money. And we do have interagency agreements, as I mentioned. And so the last time that um, we, reviewed those, I believe is in 2019, maybe 2020. And so our intention is to review those, you know, on a regular cycle and we keep track of some issues and ideas, both from our perspective, as well as from our partner agencies' perspectives <coughs> of what to include in the next um, iteration of those interagency agreements. So that could be a tool and a vehicle and a process that we use to, um, you know, as next steps for what you all were just describing. And Director Daly, one final question. That um, agreement is also for the parent-run boards? Is okay. Yes. Thank Everybody you. on that chart at the beginning, all of those. Great. Mm -hmm. Are there any additional well, questions? Well, that, this has been, a, in my view, uh, a good discussion, uh, a, a somewhat hopeful discussion. But I'm particularly interested in being able to respond to the people who spoke at, the last, uh, at our last meeting and said that they're going to not be able to send their kids to the before and after school program as they had been. Um, I would hope that we could give a response to those parents. And the response would be that uh, this is the way you can continue to afford to send your kid to that program. Uh, Director Easton. I said I hope. Okay, because I'm like, I, I totally agree that um, 
you know, acknowledgement and um, compassion for the families, but we have to make sure we don't make promises we can't keep as a um, board and district. But yes, I do think that it's important for us to communicate back um, I believe we communicated with our last families that came and spoke to us, the Hills families that came last year. I don't know if um, you all recalled, but we had a group of them that came when they came off of funding. Um, I was here when the Twain families came off funding. And I think some of us are gonna be here when the next group comes off funding. Um, and I, I wish there was a way for us to uh, fund every single child, but I think to get close to that is tapping into those resources and communicating, keeping the lines of communication open. Right. And I, frankly, it helps me to understand if, if for some reason we, if we can or cannot provide the funding that that person asked for, that helps me to understand what we're doing, what we could be doing, what other things we might try. Mm -hmm. Sure. Agreed. All right. Anything else? All right. And um, Director Daly, I think Superintendent Degner said you were also going to address the mental health work group. Up next, too. Okay. It's our Learning Supports Department show. I wish I had something fun and interactive like the previous presentation. <laughs> Director Pilcher Hyatt can just jump up and touch the. <laughs> Um, so again, um, as we get started with the mental health work group update, I just wanted to reference Crean Frank, a coordinator. She really has been vital in really all the supports and services that we have um, that support student uh, mental health and well-being in our district over the course of many years and has been vital in the implementation of the work group as well. And she just may interject at any time um, if she has some things to add um, or if there's some questions that she might be uh, better equipped to address. So um, I think Superintendent Degner was gonna say a couple things about yep. just how the work group got started and then I'll take it from there. Uh, so last year, you know, with another unfortunate circumstance, uh, we had talked about forming a mental health work group. We had a lot of uh, different pieces going on in the district that uh, Lauren Crean lead and um, I really feel strong about our work that we're leading in this area. Uh, in comparison to the districts, and it's, a, it's another one of those uh, concerns that we've expected our institution of public ed to take on and to work on with our students and with our families, and, and I think we've done an admirable, admirable job of that. Uh, so as we've pulled together this work group, we started with a, a more core focused team uh, to identify you know, this big topic and what is the school's role, what is um, you know, private practice role or uh, pr uh, mental health experts outside of the school community's role to really try to talk about as a community, like where does this all fit, right? Because we're all responsible for part of the challenge. And so uh, the group's done a nice job with, with looking at that first. We have had some feedback from people asking about um, certain segments of our population and how they're included for in the accounting of this work group. And, and just like anything we do in ed, right, we start with everybody, right, for all. Um, that's, that's part of what we always talk about. We're all in for all kids, and so we're going to consider for all. And then it's always been part of the plan to know we're going to have to meet with uh, elements of our school community in a, in a more intense, uh, ongoing fashion because their, their needs are going to be unique and different. Um, and so I think Laura uh, will do a nice job of kind of walking you through uh, where they've been, what they're doing, and, and where they plan to go next uh, with this. But we, we definitely do see this as a, as a critical part of our work. Um, and then just even how we, you know, unfortunately had to open the meeting again tonight knowing that our kids are dealing with a lot of loss, a lot of things in the news, our work session or our operations meeting beforehand. I mean, it's kind of unreal the amount of stuff we're expecting our kids to process and deal with. So, so this conversation is not going away for the district anytime soon. Thank you, Superintendent Degner. So we will review the overall purpose of the work group, um, a summary of the process, the meetings that we've engaged in, and then what some next steps entail. Um, the purpose of the work group, um, as you can see, was to develop, is to develop long and short-term recommendations um, regarding ways to sustain, to streamline, and improve our multi-tiered system of supports for the provision of mental health and wellness supports and services available to our school community. While it's focused on students, we know that our school community encapsulates staff, faculty, um, parents, families, and the broader community. Um, 
so <coughs> as we worked with the group, um, we began to recognize that we came at this from a variety of different uh, professional and personal experiences. And um, because of that, um, and because we knew that there was so much stake um, in this process that we would be engaging in, that we took um, a sufficient, a thorough amount of time to get to develop our individual and our collective why as a group. Why? Because many of the people who were serving and co will continue to serve on this are volunteering their time, just like you all. And so to really get at the heart of um, what they can bring to the table professionally and personally, and then what we could do collectively as a group while knowing that it would take the input of the whole um, stakeholder community was something that we established at the very beginning. Um, just one of the uh, work group members um, sharing out was, and this is someone who doesn't work directly um, in the school district, said, that mental health supports are so critical. School personnel are on the front lines and often the primary contact away from home for our children. It's important to ensure that the district is well positioned to identify and respond to the mental health needs of the student body. So that was that work group members why and um, what they were bringing to the table. Um, and so as we began to um, work together, we identified the goals that you can see on the board there. We want to increase the overall community understanding of what mental health and wellness services are currently in place. So what do we have? What are we offering? Um, what are we monitoring at this point in time? And then identify services and supports that are, um, could, be could be improved. Maybe there are services or supports that we could fade. Maybe there are some that we could add. Maybe there's something new and different we could do. Um, so what needs to be improved? And then also to identify gaps in those services and supports um, and propose ideas and, and next steps to fill those gaps. So we came into this as a group very action-oriented. Um, we heard a lot from many of the um, work group members. This isn't just going to be a group that we talk about what things and nothing really happens. Like, are we really going to be able to get the attention of the district, of the school board? You know, what is this going to look like? And so um, as we met, we proposed um, kind of a work together. Of course, Karina and I were working behind the scenes between the meetings and crafting a roadmap that could be... Um, could be adjusted as we went along. Um, a reminder that um, the mental health work group information is also on the district website and that lists the members and um, the various um, identities, backgrounds, diversity that they bring to the table. Um, that includes, um, for example, um, members of the BIPOC community, LGBTQ+, and we do have the parent of an entitled student. One thing that we um, would be and had been very cautious about is we would never want to reveal any personally identifiable information. And as questions began to arise about the group's composition and makeup, um, a parent said, it's okay to say that I am the parent of a student with an IEP. And so, um, you know, I just think that's an important thing to recognize that we all bring, we all brought different um, backgrounds and perspectives to the group, but um, in response to some of those questions that we received, we did want to state that. Um, also, along kind of the topic of conversation tonight, we do, as, as this group is identifying the range of services and supports, both from a prevention standpoint and a response standpoint, um, some of the members of our work group work with our partner agencies. Um, and that was intentional because they too hear from uh, parents and students about what we are or may not be doing well in the district. So they get a different perspective about um, experiences that students and families have within our schools than we do as direct um, uh, staff members at, or district members at time. And I just wanted to give a, a public thank you to UA United Action for Youth Crisis Advocate advocacy and mediation team, it's led by Amy Colley, um, as well as um, Communities Mobile Crisis Response Team uh, with Parth Patel. They both 
um, and some of their other staff have been out at these response situations at our school, such as Liberty, um, these past couple of days and during other um, crisis response situations. So it does take our whole community. And um, we just thought, because both of those agencies um, are represented in our mental health work group, um, we also wanted to give them a thank you and a shout out for what they do to support us in those times of crisis. So, um, while um, we began, our first official meeting was, a, is in, was in May of last year, but we started to formulate the group and begin some communication back in April. Um, and uh, we built that group's collective background knowledge with just why we were doing this, and, and as I mentioned, developed our collective and individual whys. Um, we proposed those outcomes and goals and then we began to discuss um, options for gathering broad stakeholder feedback. We had a lot of discussion about how are we going to get stakeholder feedback. Um, we knew that a survey would get us some um, level of key information and feedback, but we knew that that would just be the beginning phases. So I think it's important to stress tonight that even though we've gone through this deliberate and intentional process over the last year, this isn't going to be done just once we share recommendations. There's perhaps going to be, um, I mean, it's to be determined because we still have to review and synthesize all of the stakeholder feedback, but it could be where we engage further in student voice and figure out forms for how to do that, where we have listening posts or other opportunities for um, sharing and listening. So I do think it's important to, um, to say that this is just the initial phase of this work group and that we'll continue to take action steps and make recommendations um, based upon the survey res results and next steps. So as we began to um, talk about how to, how to um, garner that broad stakeholder feedback, um, we worked to collaboratively to create the survey that hopefully you all filled out and um, provided feedback to. And our um, original plan was to field test the questions on a, in a more personalized way. So each of our work group members um, back at the beginning of the year were asked to find um, a small number of um, community people, could be students, parents, former uh, students, staff, um, to ask that set of questions that you saw and um, to collect it that way. Our intent was that we know that our typical send out an electronic survey may not reach mm -hmm. all of the um, populations that we want it to reach. All the, and so our intent was to use our work group in the context of their work and interactions, whether it be personally or professionally, to say, hey, I've got a set of questions the district is working to improve um, their mental health supports and services. Would you mind taking a couple minutes to sit down with me and just answer the questions? Um, and then I'll share that feedback with the group. So we did that um, for a short period of time. And the timing was such that with some evolving issues that were arising in the legislature, we began to realize that we may just need to send the survey out sooner than later so that we could just keep the language that was embedded in it. And so um, that personal aspect of the feedback that we had intended to be a little bit longer um, got cut a little bit short because we decided to just go ahead and get it sent out. Um, so um, we are at the point now where um, the survey's been closed for a few weeks since, I don't know, I lost track after spring break, shortly after spring break. And um, we are working now, um, we've been working to arrange with the UI, University of Iowa, um, Scanlon Center for School and Mental Health. Um, we have someone coming this week um, on Friday to help us process and synthesize the results. So that's been on the books and we've got that planned. And um, that will be the development of recommendations to identify themes, patterns, um, we may be ready to share recommendations in one of the next upcoming meetings. It could take about a month. It just depends how in-depth that process analysis goes. But we thought it was important to have um, a professional from the Scanlon Center for School Mental Health to help us with that. And we're very grateful and thankful for what they'll be um, 
providing for us um, in that regard. And um, so we're excited to see what the results are. We have, um, we had about, we think 1,800 respondents, um, lots and lots of narrative, you know, we kept open fields um, available for that very reason, a lot of comments um, to sort through. Of course, we'll be careful to um, make sure we omit any identifiable information or any specific situations, um, but it's, it's gonna be a lot of rich information to process together that will lead to some recommendations to identify those, those outcomes and purposes I listed at the beginning. Um, and then I don't have um, much more to share because it's to be determined. You know, we will see what those results um, share with us and how we're able to formulate some recommendations. And um, we'll continue to work um, to identify those. While I was up here tonight, I thought I would say the fun fact that we are, um, we got a contract um, to begin to implement teen mental health first aid. And so those of you who, who have been through um, youth mental health first aid training, maybe as a staff member or faculty member, it's a day long training where, um, and that's part of what we've been providing to our district staff and we've got the summer dates for that coming out soon for the youth mental health first aid training. We've been doing that through gear grant funds that we've mentioned before. Um, but the next iteration that is way more powerful and we're very excited about is to um, begin to implement the teen mental health first aid training. And that's where teens are teaching teens. Um, so we'll share more about that and that will be part of our recommendations for how, how to um, implement that. And um, we're also working with the University of Iowa Scanlon for School Mental Health to implement a grant that um, Superintendent Degner has signed a couple years ago that they finally got uh, to provide some additional mental health training um, for our district staff. So that will be embedded within the recommendations. So, so th those are some things we had in the works and in place, but it will be included within um, some additional new recommendations for where we believe we need to go as a district. Um, any, any questions? Um, for me and or Corrine. Directors, feel free to jump in. Uh, I, I just want to really commend uh, you and the other staff, Superintendent Degner, for uh, um, implementing this work group in the way that you've done it. Um, some of the comments I think I've received uh, through email have been that we didn't have enough representation on the work group itself. But the work group's decision is to get representation by doing surveys and reaching out, uh, which to me is likely to result in a broader understanding of what the entire community uh, wants to see us do in terms of uh, supporting students in their, uh, with mental health issues. So I, I think this is a really sound approach mm -hmm. we're taking. Thank you for that feedback. Yeah, I would just come in too. I mean, I, I think I remember asking you guys for a real simple graphic about everything for mental health uh, a couple of years ago. And, and I probably knew how crazy an ask that was at the time, but because there's so much. And really, it's, it's a process, and we, we don't have something that's simple. It's not a simple answer. It involves, I mean, back then, Scanlon wasn't even around, and that's a very new entity that, that I'm excited about and excited about us working with. Um, and yeah, I'd love to hear about that teen mental health first aid. That's, um, mental health first aid has been a very powerful training tool. And, uh, and just to have teen, I mean, that's who really needs it. I mean, sure, teachers and staff are often on the front line, but not as often as kids are and friends are. And so to have tools in kids' hands to know where to turn to and who to turn to um, and where to um, get their friends um, connected with is really powerful. So I'm excited to see this was going and I really, really appreciate this work. Yeah, that's all Coordinator Frank. She, she has done all of that research and written the grants and, and arranged all of that, so we're very grateful for her. We do have a graphic in the works as well. This isn't only about my awesome. other presentation making less happy, so we will work on that as well. But we do have a gra uh, draft um, that takes many of the universal practices that we know support um, student mental health and well-being 
and also that lays out the specific interventions and services particular to student mental health. I, so, it, yeah, that is appreciated because it, it is a lot and, and this, that's going to be easier for people to see it yep. and understand yep. uh, where things are at. We're showing it to a, you know, the work group, a few different people to get some final feedback before we're, we're getting it to like almost final form. Great. Yeah. And very multifaceted too. Um, I just was a little bit curious about the teen mental health first aid. If you could tell us a little bit more about what that entails. You mentioned there'd be training over the summer. <sighs> The, I probably didn't explain that well, the training that is going to occur this summer is the youth mental health first aid, and we've been doing that for the last, I mean, it's been in existence for many years, but our district, through the GEAR grant that coordinator Frank wrote, um, have been providing opportunities for staff to attend that on a regular basis. So those dates for summer training for the youth mental health first aid are gonna be shared out pretty soon. Then, we just got an email today um, with um, the teen mental health first aid training that we will work on to coordinate details about. So the teen is the youth, to, the teen to teen, the peers that are teaching each other about mental health and wellness. That is in like the baby stages, but the youth mental health first aid that adults take to know how to support youth in their schools, those dates are gonna be coming out soon. Okay. I kind of was mixing that together because I was a little excited. No, that clears it up. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Any other additional questions? Okay. Thank you so much, Director Thank you. Daly. Next up, we move on to our action items for tonight. Um, the first action item that I would entertain a motion for is, nope, first we're going to see if there's any questions. <laughs> the 700 series that we talked about earlier. Were there any further items of discussion? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion. I move that we approve the 700 series. Second. Board Secretary Colvin, we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Next up is the proposed certified budget and tax certification. I don't know if there was comments from CFO Finger. I have nothing further than uh, it's the same information that was presented to you uh, at March 28th meeting. So uh, this is just the formal process for that. Thank you. Hearing no further discussion, I would entertain a motion. I move that we uh, pass the proposed certified budget and tax certification. Second. Board Secretary Colvin, we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Next up is a resolution fixing a date for a public hearing on proposed use of save revenue for athletic infrastructure project. Were there any items for discussion or comment? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion. Uh, I move that we approve the resolution to fix the date for public hearing on the proposed use of save revenue for an athletic facility infrastructure project. Second. Board Secretary Coburn, we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. <clears throat> all votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Next up is the resolution fixing a date for public hearing on a proposed issuance of school infrastructure, sales, services, and use tax revenue and refunding bonds. Was there any further discussion on that? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion. I move that we pass a resolution fixing a date for public hearing on the proposed issuance of approximately $76,500,000 school infrastructure sales, service, and use tax revenue and refunding bonds, often referenced as save revenue bonds. All right, uh, JP, I 
Could you state the amount again, please? Uh, 76, uh, sorry, 76 million, 500,000. Thank you. Second. Board Secretary Coven, ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. And the last action item for tonight is the reconsideration committee members. Um, I don't know if Superintendent Degner, you want to provide some details? Yeah, I think uh, I will. We've had uh, this topic in the news and, uh, since we had the bomb threats at Northwest Junior High and uh, we had that title removed from district libraries and um, of course, we know from several conversations this evening that the safety of our students and staff is, is our number one priority when, when they're entrusted in our care. Um, this was the closest policy uh, that we had in the district to try to deal with uh, something similar to this type of a challenge. Uh, really the, specific, the specificity of the threat, um, the timeliness of uh, the concern that got to us and the repeated nature of it uh, really raised our level of concern from even other bomb threats we've dealt with in the district. Uh, and so there was a great level of concern that we had uh, those days, uh, massive disruption caused, uh, you know, in the school district and to that school campus. Um, and so that's all very real, right, and all very real in what it means and, and how our people perceive that in today's day and age. Uh, and then, of course, we understand, you know, the very sensitive nature of intellectual freedom and the freedom to read and making sure that our kids are represented in our libraries throughout the district. And so those are, those are two uh, big conversations for us, very important conversations for us. Um, but, I, but I think for us, then it's about, okay, how do we move forward? And what is the best way for us to move forward and knowing that we might have some issues in conflict? Um, and so we have a chance to demonstrate a process that we use in the district and a process that works uh, that we can um, also, I think, in, a, in some way, educate people around that this is the process that if you have a concern, here's how the concern can be dealt with. This is why we have an board policy. This is why we script it out. <coughs> really have, uh, uh, I'm going to just keep repeating myself and saying process, but uh, what I wanted to say was this is what we shared with Des Moines last year when they were starting this conversation about book banning and some of these things is, hey, we have a process that works, it's right here, right? So we should not be afraid to use it. We should not be afraid to say uh, this is something that we can point to and that um, can really deal with concerns when they come forward. So with all of that said, you do have uh, three community members uh, for your consideration uh, to be added to the reconsideration committee. Uh, the superintendent is in charge of appointing the other members of the reconsideration committee. So there will be five other members that will join these three uh, after your approval. Uh, and then they'll have 10 days to schedule their first meeting. They'll select a chair uh, and eventually they'll make a recommendation uh, to myself on that. And I do plan to follow the recommendation of the reconsideration committee. Um, I don't think that's uh, for me to micromanage or to come in later after the fact and say, well, you recommended this, but, you know, we feel different. And so uh, what does come out of that reconsideration committee, you guys will see. You will not see something different from me. I'll make sure to present that directly to you guys from that group. So I know we're a ways away from that, but I thought it was also good just to acknowledge that and make sure that people are aware of where that comes from. Uh, 605.3 is the actual policy and then there's the administrative regulation uh, under 6053 that really details out the process and it is very well scripted out. Um, so if we're not as familiar uh, as we need to be with that, I would encourage people to check that out because we'll try to stay as close and adhere to that as possible. So any questions for me? Go ahead, Director. So um, one of the things I've been asked by community members, and we've been talking about it, I think a lot of people are talking about this because as you said, it's in the news. Um, I think I just, a lot of us would like to have a better understanding about, um, about how our um, highly trained teacher librarians make those decisions for their buildings. Um, we're lucky to have such professional um, teacher librarians, but unless you've, you know, gone through that and have that expertise, I don't know, I don't know exactly know how it all works. So um, if at some point um, maybe we could hear more about the front end of these things, like how do, how do books end up on the shelves at the different buildings, like the different aged kids and everything? I would be interested to learn more about it. That's a great point. I, I, I would second that. Um, 
I did have a question. Can you speak to um, any details you can offer about the background of these three individuals that um, you're recommending? Sure. <clears throat> so uh, Mr. Kenyon uh, is, I think most people would probably be familiar with Mr. Kenyon out of uh, the three on the list. Uh, he's uh, director of the UNESCO City of Literature. Uh, and so this is a field where he's comfortable in and, and spends his professional career. Moni Galpin works at the University of Iowa and is engaged with DEI work at the University of Iowa. I think it's important for this committee to also have a broad representation of our district, knowing that these challenges can come from all different facets of different titles we have in the library. And then Susan Craig is the former director of the uh, public library here in Iowa City. So again, good challenge, good, or excuse me, good um, experience in this area, uh, good frame of reference to come at it with. And so three highly qualified individuals uh, on our perspective. Thanks for asking that, uh, President Malone. Uh, the other thing I would say is I think our librarians would really welcome that opportunity, uh, similar to you know, how I had stated, I don't think we should be fearful of, the, of this process necessarily, that they would be like, like to also have the chance to say, hey, this is how we go about it, right? And this is what our training has been. Here's how we review books. Here's how we make the decisions to have them. Um, and just be open and transparent about it. I think this is another issue that's caught public schools uh, in a lot of larger conversations about what is or what isn't happening there. And so there's no reason we should shy away from uh, being open and honest and transparent about our procedures. Great. Were there any additional? Yeah, I, you know, I just comment that obviously I trust our staff and I'll be excited, but I, I just think we're lucky to have this caliber of individual from mm -hmm. our community who can, who can go through this process because obviously, you know, the book, you know, doesn't just get um, attention locally, but nationally. And, and I, it just feels good that in Iowa City, UNESCO City of Literature, you know, we can deal with this. And, and I appreciate the boards previously, way previously, who came up with this policy. It doesn't get used very much, but it is detailed, it is robust. And I think, um, you know, I think whenever we have a question about materials we choose or whatever, that we have a process that we can trust. And we go through it, and it's transparent, it's public, people are aware of it. Um, and, and I'm just, uh, you know, I, it's, it's unfortunate the way this came about, absolutely unfortunate with the, the conversation, I think, surrounding some of the, these materials, but uh, it just makes me happy to be a member of this community and this school board that has this process in place um, to, to, to put a piece of literature through and, and really come out of, as to, and to listen to what they've got to say. I would just echo JP's comments and also just very grateful that these individuals are willing to serve in this capacity. And, and I would just flag for people maybe listening at home, I believe John has kids in the, I'm not sure about Susan or Monique, but John at least also has kids in the, in the district as well. Yes, John does, yeah. yeah. Yep, so he's a current parent, yeah, just like when we were talking about mental health work group, yes, we have, you know, some parent representation there. Some of our staff members that will be involved also have kids, so they'll be serving in a dual capacity. Um, yeah, I think that addresses your question. And we, students are on the committee too as well, right? Students are currently on the committee. Yep. Uh, the one piece I didn't share is um, Senate File 496 would exclude students from the committee, so again, depending on what happens with legislation and if... Uh, those things are effective on enactment. You know, we may have to readjust or pivot. Um, I would also say there'd be probably some media attention around these meetings. They're subject to open meetings records laws. Um, my advice to the board would be not to comment until they've had a chance to do their work and bring us back a recommendation at that point. Um, but I, I would anticipate we'll have some media coverage there. I think we're gonna have to, I think, um we're going to have to be ready to hear decisions over time, including this decision, whatever it ends up maybe. Not all of us are going to love it either, but we're not the, we're not on the committee, <laughs> and the committee is intentionally formed. So I know that that can happen, and this is yes. just our first run. That's a great point. <laughs> so thank you. Mm -hmm. Director mm -hmm. Easton. Uh, I just want to really thank Matt as superintendent for making these uh, community, community member uh, recommendations for this committee. I think it's a fantastic choice, uh, uh, brilliant on your part in, in asking these particular three folks to serve on this particular committee. I also want to uh, remark for the board's consideration and for the community too, that I think uh, Matt's uh, <coughs> uh, invoking this reconsideration process as a superintendent was totally uh, appropriate 
for the way the uh, policies are written and the situation mm -hmm. that we were faced with. Thank you, Charlie. Okay, here, no further discussion. I would entertain a motion. I move that we approve the reconsideration committee members. Second. Director Coven, I'm sorry, no. Board Secretary Coven, we're ready to vote. I just appointed you on the board. <laughs> Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thank you. Next up is our legislative update. Um, this Friday is our final forum. And I don't know if Superintendent Degner had any additional comments. I see you looking at what's available. Yeah, the final. legislative update. I'm not sure much is new to you guys. Um, we do have our final legislative forum on Friday. Uh, I would say the next legislative deadline that's important is April 28th. That's when the legislative per diem runs out. So then they're there on their own dime rather than uh, being paid. Um, on that daily basis to do so. Uh, I would also point out Senate File 496 is the one to pay, I think, probably the greatest attention to to see what ends up uh, here because it is uh, that omnibus bill that includes so many different elements uh, from pieces of the conversation we were just having uh, to make up of Board of Educational Examiners, um, pronoun usage for students and, and what staff's responsibility around that is. Um, We've received feedback from a couple community members that I think would like to see us uh, be able to respond to these uh, pieces of legislation um, quicker. Um, I think we would also like that or appreciate that opportunity uh, if they weren't effective upon enactment. And so we're, we're definitely hopeful that uh, whatever does happen at the legislature is given a, a pathway for districts to be able to implement this and rec some recognition of 14,000 students and 2,000 staff members. Uh, that need time and space to implement these, that we can't um, switch a whole system in a 24-hour time period and expect people to be knowledgeable and comfortable about what that guidance or what that law is. So um, we, would, we would definitely continue to ask for that and some respect given um, in our process to try to make sure we can uphold the provisions of whatever law the legislature deems that we need to follow in that, in that regard. So a lot of different pieces in uh, Senate file um, uh, 496 that I'm not going to go back through here again, but I think that's one. They're tied up in appropriations right now, so that's kind of one why we're also on hold at that time of year with appropriations. So um, we can ask more questions on Friday when we see the legislators. Uh, by that point, uh, they've been kind of slow getting back into session this week um, after the holiday this weekend. Uh, so there wasn't anything of note I saw today. Brady could correct me. I know he's better about checking that, but I didn't see anything on there today, Brady, that happened substantially, so. No, uh, the only thing that happened, there's a permanent teacher licensure that passed the House today, 98 to nothing, I think. The permanent one without yeah, the permanent credits? Yeah, the permanent one, so you don't, yeah. So, so everybody's gonna love that. Yeah, it's gonna have a lot of popular. Gonna sweeten the deal yeah, for them. Exactly. So that's yeah. the only thing. Otherwise, yeah, they're pretty stuck on the budget stuff. So. Okay. Real, real quick, I would just add to what you said that it wasn't just that, that it was effective um, immediately, it was that the, the law itself, it's not like we were told to turn all our desks to face east. It, the, the law itself is, is nuanced and very difficult to um, um, implement. Mm -hmm. So we're still trying to figure that out and, and we have council trying to help us figure it out. So the district got as ahead of it as you possibly can when you're dealing with a law that is this difficult to implement. Agreed. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. It's good to hear honesty from an attorney. <laughs> 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 um, no. Okay. On that, on that note, um, next up on the agenda is the director liaison reports. Come on, people. Um, I don't know if any directors wanted to highlight anything that they um, took part in over the last month, month and a half, because some of these date back to February. Um, I'm gonna highlight something that's coming up that I've been working on, not in my director hat, but in my parent hat, and that is the Penn Elementary Wizard of Oz production, three years in the making. 
Uh, it started, it was slated to be done in April of 2020, and of course we all know where we were in April of 2020. We were in home, in isolation. So it's happening. I would like to extend an invitation to all of my board members and the admin team, and I'll send the flyer around via email. Um, we've got about 100 kids involved, and it's gonna be at Liberty's Auditorium. So board members, if you haven't had a chance to be in Liberty's Auditorium, uh, this is a great chance. Um, and these kiddos have worked so hard. Uh, we're just so proud of them, and it's uh, shaping up to be a terrific show. So I hope you can come. What's the date again? It's next weekend. It's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, um, the 21st, 22nd, 23rd. The Friday and Saturday shows are at 7.30, and then a Sunday matinee at 2.30. It's super family-friendly, obviously. It's all uh, third through sixth graders. So please come. <laughs> okay. Any other highlights? I, I would just say that there's a, a, a couple of us board members that have gone around and visited some of the ele elementary schools in the district, and I will just say that I'm just so impressed at the, with the leadership that we have in our elementaries and um, just the, the love that they exude for, for their students that they have. So Thank that's you. all. Great. Thank you for highlighting that. Next up is agenda setting. Um, first is a policy and governance meeting um, in two weeks, April 25th. And it looks like you all will be reviewing the 800 series. Is there anything else that should be on there? Okay, hearing none, we'll, oh. Did you, have, oh, you made a sound. Oh, no, it was just a no. <laughs> yep. okay. I was agreeing you with you. Oh, yeah, okay, need better hand signals. That's hard okay. for us, yeah. Um, moving on, our regular board meeting is also that night. We have an education showcase um, and regular items, equity update. I don't know um, any presentations planned for that night. We'll see if we can get librarians turned around um, that quickly. We'll, we'll engage with Lisa Petrie and, as the coordinator and see if we could have something that evening. Uh, JP, we've kind of held off on the Pearl update since it's been subject to a lot of the different appropriations bills, and, um, but if it survives this session, then we'll come back with a presentation on that. But librarians was really the other one I had written down. We'll work on an edge showcase item equity update. Um, <coughs> that was all I had on the list, though. Okay. And um, before we adjourned, I wanted to take a moment to publicly congratulate Deputy Superintendent Amy Courtmeyer, who was named as the next superintendent for Lenmar. She will be leaving us at the end of the school year, and we'll have an opportunity to go around the table and roast her, but I just wanted to acknowledge um, all of her hard work and to say congratulations from the board. You're welcome. And with that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Have a good night, everybody.